How is it going, everybody? This is Sean Barnes. I want to welcome you to episode 84 of The Way of the Wolf. Our guest today is actually calling in from Italy. Our paths crossed about a month or so on LinkedIn. We got connected via a good friend of both of ours, Cami Lehman. She's just been fantastic. But when he and I had a conversation to just kind of talk a little bit about what he does and what I do, just things just started clicking and his messaging really resonated with me. And I thought this would be a phenomenal guest to bring on to the show. He is an author, a life coach. He does uh, keynote presentations as a public speaker. And then his, his primary goal and focus is around sparking transformation and helping people live a life of purpose. With all that being said, Robert Party, welcome to The Way of the Wolf. Sean, thank you very much. It is great to be here. Um, you're right, it was Cami that introduced us. And um, definitely when I heard some of your podcasts, I was like, this is a guy I need to know. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Let's start off with telling the listeners a little bit about yourself. Sure. Um, it's a little unusual as a story, right? But it's part of transformation. So um, I've always been someone, I think, very motivated by change. And I think if I'm really honest about it, I grew up um, in a dysfunctional relationship with an alcoholic dad. And so that taught me a lot about uncertainty and, you know, having to deal with situations and a lot of life skills, really, which I'm so thankful I learned. And so I wound up pursuing finance because I was like, wow, the best thing for me to, as a kid, I was like, money is going to save me. And I'm a kid of the 80s, right? Like, you know, Dynasty, Dallas, um, Wall Street, all that stuff. So I was like, yeah, it's money, man. That's what's going to get me. <laughs> and, um, you know, became an investment banker, got my MBA from Columbia University, really was excelling, um, met an amazing woman. I was offered a job in the Middle East. We had been married at the time. I was uh, recruited by the Abu Dhabi Investment Authority, which I don't know if people know or not, but it was just an amazing experience and an amazing opportunity. But during that opportunity, my wife, um, before her 31st birthday, was diagnosed with late stage breast cancer. And that changed everything. Um, not that I needed to be her caregiver, which is really interesting because she was extremely self-sufficient. She battled, um, I actually shouldn't say battled because I don't like to use that word. She journeyed through her, her disease for 11 years and she just excelled. I, on the other hand, I wound up becoming her life coach, which is really funny because I was trying to keep her motivated and give her support and show her how she could, you know, achieve the goals she wanted to achieve. My job took a backseat until I finally did have to leave, of course, because um, she just wasn't well enough. But she became the founding director of palliative care at New York Hospital with metastatic breast cancer. Wow. And what I realized at that point in time was the. Was the value of mindset was the availability of transformation for everyone was understanding purpose because for me what i realized in my journey with her was we put a huge weight on purpose but purpose at the end of the day is when your passions come in alignment with your values and you want to give the results away and i realized that's what it is that's what purpose really is and so after she passed away I ran back to finance because that's what I knew, and it just wasn't there anymore. Uh, my perspective, my purpose, my passion, everything changed. And because of transformation, because of my belief in transformation, I looked at my life. I looked at the story that I wanted to look back on, and it included moving to Italy. And it included just reimagining, redesigning my life. And I became a life coach, a certified life coach really to force myself to learn Italian because I did it in Italian. And I moved to Italy without speaking the language, without having a job, without knowing anybody. I just sort of showed up one day. Talk about stepping uh, out of your comfort zone. That's, I think, what my childhood taught me. Because it was so uncomfortable 
in the circle I was in that it was, let's say, less scary, less uncomfortable to actually step out and become something different. And um, I learned a lot in, in that for sure. And so what wound up happening is I realized that all these lessons I learned, you know, they're about grit, they're about resilience, they're, they're about determination, they're about optimism, they're about joy, um, being in the present moment. All of that is what really makes up life. Um, in terms of being constructive in your life, being the craftsperson of your life. And yeah, I had to right size my life, you know, to live the way I live. Um, I probably could have been making tons of money if I stayed in Dubai. But it wasn't the journey I wanted to go on. So that that's sort of who I am in my background, like what brought me to to all of this. What I find interesting about that and Actually, I had the opportunity to purchase your book recently, which we're going to talk about here in a, in a little bit. But another thing that I appreciate and respect is that on your journey, you've come to this realization that there's so much more to life than money. I, I would imagine being an investment banker in Abu Dhabi, you made a significant amount of money. And picking up and moving to Italy, and I think I remember reading in your book that whenever you move there, you're earning like $8 an hour or something like that, just kind of starting off. But in you and I's interactions that we've had so far, you seem so happy and fulfilled, and and that speaks to the importance of living that life of purpose and finding your passion and just going all in. Money's not going to solve your problems, and that's part of the thing that that I've learned over the years in, in my journey. I've been very fortunate and done fairly well for myself, and I've come to the realization that like none of that – that matters. It just doesn't bring a sense of fulfillment. And and your journey is yet another example of the truth that exists in that. I love that you called out the the, the fact that, you know, money's not going to bring you fulfillment. There is, of course, a certain perceived safety level with money. Now, I'll be I'll be perfectly honest. My wife was 30 when she was diagnosed. She didn't have life insurance. Um, you know, we were, we were still kids, really. So when she passed away after the 11 years, when back in the late 90s, early 2000s, you couldn't find organic food, you couldn't find supplements. I mean, that my any savings I had vanished where I had a ton of debt when she passed away, and I went back to Dubai to actually sort of pay off the debt, but that whole idea of, and this is what I meant about right-sizing as well, the whole idea of chasing money, money couldn't save my wife. There was just no way around it. Watching what we achieved together that had nothing to do with money made me realize that one you know we're all on the same one-way train we just don't know when we're going to get to our stop so we give it all away anyway so what is it what is the money you need to live the life you want and for me showing up here in italy teaching english for eight dollars an hour it was the only thing i could do at that moment but it was a part of me going after the life I wanted and saying, you know what? Yeah, I, I have had drinks with the Princess of Sweden and I have met Paris Hilton. And yeah, I had some crazy experiences, you know, in Dubai and Abu Dhabi. That's what does that really do for me in the end? Right. Um, so. I looked at that right-sized my life and realized that money, when you get to the point where there's 
comfort. Like I see a lot of people, they just continue to accumulate. And so therefore they need more money. And I was like, very essential. I live an essential life. If I have to leave this house tomorrow, the only thing that's coming with me is the painting behind me. And if I have to leave that, you know what, then I have to leave that. But other than that, it's not all that important, this stuff. What's important is the experience I have. And that's what, when you talked about, you know, passion and purpose and all of that, that's what we carry with us. And that's our legacy, which is really crazy as well. We could all be Bill Gates, maybe, and leave 116 billion or whatever he said he's going to leave. But we are examples. We are content creators in other people's lives. We have ripples through our efforts and our actions and our thoughts. And that's really what we leave when when we leave the earth. At least that's my opinion. And so I'd rather know that I've accumulated a lot of experiences that filled my passion and purpose instead of stuff. Robert, my God, I, I love that. That is so powerful and something that, you know, for me, I, I kind of flash back to, you know, I've never had drinks with Paris Hilton. I never had the opportunity to meet some of these these high profile individuals that, that you've had the opportunity to. For me, I was always focused. I was always big into to cars and racing and stuff like that. So it was always fastest car, newest upgrades. You just like always trying to keep up with the Joneses and, and beat out my friends and stuff. And I've just come to the realization that that's not really how you positively impact the people's lives around you. And it was probably in my mid thirties or so that I started to realize there, there has to be more than, than just having cool stuff. And I, I found a passion around leadership development and coaching and, and that all stemmed from my journey into leading human resources. But I've just started seeing how, how fulfilling it is to positively impact the lives of those around you and the ripple effect that you touched on. Whenever I think about all the people that I coach, it's not just their lives that I have the opportunity to impact because if I can help that person be more successful or be a just better person in life, that's going to positively impact and influence all of their family, all of their friends. And that ripple effect, I think, so beautifully articulates that thought process. And it just, man, that really resonated with me. I, I realized, and, and really part of it was, was my wife's oncologist which was just an, an, an amazing man and um, understanding the impacts we could have just from small little gestures as well, like where we're not always the center of everything. And that idea of giving. Also, India was a huge eye opener for me. I remember when I was um, we my my wife and I, we went to India a lot while she was ill and she would volunteer in a hospital in India. And so I would volunteer in a food hall. And I remember hundreds of people coming into this food hall and sitting on a dirt floor with a banana leaf in front of them. That was their plate. And it was a scoop of rice and a scoop of dal and they mix it together with their hands. And so many people would offer me the first bite. And this was probably the only meal they were going to get the whole day and they were so grateful and they would say, this is such abundance for me. Why wouldn't I share it with you? And I started to think about all of that, that from from stuff to money to even emotions, we, we stay very closed a lot of times. Um, you know, learning from mistakes is, is, a, is a big thing we hide from. And so we're not looking to share a lot of the times uh, on so many different things. And then you mentioned keeping up with the Joneses. First, I'd like to know who ever said we have to keep up with anyone. I, I'd really like to know where that comes from. Second, that is all about comparison, which is extremely corrosive. Um, and we've forgotten what admiration is all about. Like what has happened to role models, looking at people. And that's why I love your show and shows like this, because I get to listen to people and think, wow, you know, that person has so many traits that I would like to embellish. I would like to learn from that. And 
it's no longer about you know, looking over the fence and seeing where the grass is greener. And I joke all the time that it's only greener where you water the grass. So, you know, stop shooting your hose over the grass, you know, over the fence. Right. Um, so I, I so agree with you that there was also for me, there was this shift. Um, and that's why when I went back to the lifestyle I had or the lifestyle I could have had, because I didn't have like the big fancy lifestyle with my wife, because that was just not the way we were. But then I went back to Dubai and I was single and I was just involved in all these different things. I probably was a little reckless because I didn't know where I belonged at that point. Uh, and I just looked around me one day and I'm like, this is not the story I want to live. This is not the impact I want to have. I'm not actually having impact. And part of the moving to Italy, which was such an amazing experience because I live where my great grandfather immigrated from. And I'm now an immigrant. I didn't speak the language. I didn't know the system. I didn't, you know, how do you get a credit card? How do you, so many different things, right? And I looked at all of that. And what I realized part of that ripple effect was I was showing my niece and nephew it's okay to take risk. Don't be so afraid. Right. And that to me, wow. I saw that with my my grandmother, who was an amazing woman. But for the most part. My generation, I think the parents of my generation was all about safety, stay in your comfort zone, stay in your job, always smile, you know, um, don't burn bridges. All that types of stuff. And so all of a sudden, what are you? You're just you're you're a drone and a victim to a situation because you're afraid of what's outside the comfort zone. Yeah. Oh, man, this is such a great topic. We could stay on this forever. Let's, <laughs> For sure. um, but I do really want to cover your book. I know I mentioned to you that I purchased it. It showed up a couple of days ago. I haven't gotten as far as I'd like to in it, but there is something that resonated with me and I would love the opportunity to read it. Is it, would that be okay? Totally. Perfect. Okay. So this page starts off with, it's just possibility and action. And there's a quote here from Richard Bach's book uh, titled one. We are each given a block of marble when we begin a lifetime in the tools to shape it into sculpture. We can drag it behind us untouched. We can pound it into gravel We can shape it into glory. When you think about it, dragging a block of marble behind ourselves represents indecision and inaction. It is exhausting. Pounding it into gravel represents a life of anger and or feeling like a victim. But shaping it into glory, that represents the life of a craftsperson. It means being proactive in our lives. It means being present. It means that while we may not see a radical change each time we chip away at our block, we know we're moving towards crafting the most beautiful life we can through patient effort. It symbolizes possibility and action. Okay, Robert, I'm only probably 35, 36 pages into the book so far, but, and and actually, as you can see, I've got all sorts of stuff highlighted and sticky notes and all <laughs> wow. Like, I cannot wait to finish this book because there is so much power in everything that you have written here. Can you talk me through what prompted you to write this? Oh, sure. Um, you know, possibility in action is is actually I gave myself a hashtag. That, that's really what it is. It's it's the way I've lived the majority of my life. And. What I realized when I started looking back and what prompted me was more the pandemic than anything else, because I started receiving a lot of inquiries to work with people. And the word I'll use is aimless people just feeling lost. And what is this all about? And, you know, everything stopped. So we had time. If you think about it, right, like we were all on a merry-go-round and then the music stopped and the merry-go-round stopped and we got to see what was around us. And we're like, is this really where I wanna be? And why am I on a frog instead of a horse? You know, <laughs> like, so uh, there there was this 
revelation that or this moment of revelation that took place and i realized that my life's philosophy really is all about that it it's about regardless of what's happening around you what is the course that you want to move down what resonates with you as as a person the beautiful thing is we're all unique so there is there's not one right way. Yes, there's this morality, which is a different issue, but there's not one right way to live a life. And somewhere along the line, we have really been sold a bill of goods about complacency and conforming and forgetting a lot of that stuff. And that's really what possibly an action was all about. That quote for me, I read it every morning and what I really love about it, and I'm really lucky because there's actually a sculptor in the town that I live in. He's 79 years old. His studio is basically an old donkey stall and um, he takes rocks from the, the big mountain behind us. And if you watch, you have to, you don't know what it's gonna look like. You don't know if inside is going to be what you're really looking for, but you have to chip away. And what are you doing when you're chipping away? You're getting rid of the unnecessary. And I think that's where we've gotten lost, if I am so general to say we, and that's what possibility in action is about, is getting to that core. That, that's really why I wrote it, because I watched my wife and I live in extraordinary life because we valued the ordinary moments and we knew what was important and we knew what was purposeful what was passion um full of passion and that's all in this idea of possibility in action the book is more you know it's a 52-week journey where there's these little short crazy stories that come into my mind like like the merry-go-round that probably will be in another book at some point in time because these things pop in my head and they really work for me but it's really just to shake up some habitual thinking um and that's chipping away right like does a lot of this stuff serve you anymore yeah yeah that's you know is <laughs> What's also interesting about this is you and I have talked, I mean, I, I do a lot of leadership development coaching and actually recently have started kind of dabbling in life coaching. I don't have a whole lot of people that I work with on that, but people have just started approaching me on on that topic, which actually kind of sounds like was what happened with, with you. But in reading through this, there, there are certain things that resonate with me because I've lived it. I've experienced it. I've drugged the marble behind me. I've pounded it into gravel. I've done all those things. And even as recently as, as this year, I'll still struggle with it. And, and I find myself kind of going down that path and, and realizing, oh, hold on, I got I to gotta pull myself out. And so the fact that you, you read this quote every single morning, it feels like it, it probably helps frame your day in the best way possible, knowing am I really doing what I need to do? Are these things that are, that are weighing me down that are, that I'm dragging behind me? Maybe I just need to start chipping away at them. Maybe I need to start making those changes. And I think we all get to that point in life where we don't realize how heavy that marble slab is behind us until yeah. we start chipping away at it, until we start shedding some of that unnecessary weight. And we're all subject to it, even though I help people and, and coach them. I myself, I'm, I'm human. We're, we're human first and, and leaders second is one of the things that I like to talk about. But I think that's part of the reason that it resonated with me so much because we all experience it. We're all human, but connecting with people like yourself and a number of other guests that we've had on the show, it's so enlightening and, and inspires me to keep pushing, to keep getting out of my comfort zone and keep chipping away. Well, one, one of the things that you, you said in terms of framing, right? Yeah, uh, it does. It does frame my day. Because just like you, I am human. 
and I can fall into old habits. And, you know, if there are, we will all have triggers. And we might think that we've dealt with that trigger until it comes around again, wearing a little different clothing, but it's still the same trigger. <laughs> and so that's part of a lot of this stuff. And I say it in the book as well. You know, the Stoics used to do this. Marcus Aurelius used to do this. Socrates used to do this. Um, presidents, um, Tim Ferriss, you know, he does a lot of this stuff as well. I'm sure Elon Musk has his own thing that he's doing. So. The thing about all of that is if you are really determined to, and I don't like saying necessarily live your best self or live your best life because it's construction, but if you want to be active in your life, to continue to grow, to evolve, to move towards the future self, then why wouldn't you put that time in to reflect upon that? And I do this with with leadership development. Um, you know, teams, the, the division itself might have a mission or vision statement, but does the leader have a statement of what type of leader they want to be? And we do have a tendency to then say, oh, wow, I really didn't live up to that today. And we'll beat ourselves up for that because that's sort of, and then it makes it uncomfortable to continue to do it because we don't want to keep beating ourselves up. And it's just changing the focus on, now I have another point of data on something that I need to work on because my goal is I want to be that version of me. And it's crazy because this does actually tie into quantum physics, though I don't really understand quantum physics, but they talk about how, you know, all these different paths we can go on or whatever like that and their choices. And so this whole idea of consciously choosing to be comfortable with discomfort or sometimes when things are difficult, say to yourself, I'm choosing to do this and I choose to feel good about it because it's it's the type of person I want to be. I ask myself a lot of times, I ask the people I work with to ask themselves this question too, is the person I would like to evolve into, how would they react here? And that's really so important in leadership because yes. you take that step back for an instant and it minimizes whatever trigger is there. And you can see with a lot more clarity. I think it takes an element of self-awareness to be able to do that. When, when I coach leaders that are kind of growing into leadership roles, because there's a number of people that I work with that maybe were individual contributors. And then because they were an incredible individual contributor, they were thrust into this, this leadership role. And as I'm sure you're well aware, it takes a very different skill set to be a successful leader than it does a strong individual contributor. And part of that is an element of self-awareness and being willing to check your ego and say, Am Am I doing this the right way? Being able to read the people in the room and say, ooh, that is an interesting response to how I communicated that message. Maybe I should reflect on that a little bit. And, and I think this is a, a really good segue in, into leadership development and how important that element of self-awareness is. Talk to me a little bit about some of the other things that you do as it pertains to leadership development. I know in our previous conversation, you've mentioned some some big corporations that you've worked with, and obviously you don't have to give the names of them. But talk me through the the typical coaching client or group that you work with. Sure. Uh, it's usually the SVP level. Okay. Uh, so, sometimes the EVP level, but – there tends to be, of course, big time constraints for them. So um, the the there's so much you said there that I, I would I would love to unpack because the self awareness requires something that's very difficult for a lot of people when they get to a certain level, and that's humility. 
because you have to you have to accept you can learn from everybody that you don't know everything and a lot of times what i do see at the svp level is they still want to hold on to n- making all the decisions let's say as if they're still on the front line but they're not on the front line anymore and there's this discomfort that takes place from that change director to svp is a huge shift in responsibility uh mentality but humility is so important uh the other thing about self-awareness is we can't be an echo chamber which means that like you said something hmm you know the way i showed up or something like that we have to create an environment as a leader that feels safe for feedback because when you're an SVP, I'm telling you right now, everyone's going to tell you you're doing a good job because they're all afraid they're, you're going to get fu- they're going to f- get fired by you or something like that, right? So, really quickly, Robert, I would like sure. to interject on, on that. I've I've had a, a number of people that have reported to me over the years, and I've actually shared this with specific individuals because there are a very small handful of them that will provide me feedback on the things that I do and not just, oh, you're doing great. Oh, you're doing great. And there's there's one vice president that comes to mind that has always been open and honest and transparent with me. And he'll straight up say, hey, uh, probably didn't handle that as well as you could have. And he and I will talk through it and most of the time I'll have recognized that because I was already reading the room and thinking, oh, you know what? I probably could have done that a little bit differently. But my feedback to him is always how much I appreciate his willingness to share that feedback with me because I want to be better just like I share feedback with him because I want him to be better. And that speaks to the importance of as leaders and senior leaders, we have to create that safe environment where everybody feels comfortable providing that feedback and making sure that we all learn and that we all grow and that we're all trying to be better. 100%. For for me, feedback is so extremely important and it shouldn't be just the quarterly review. You know, and it shouldn't be ticking the boxes on certain things. The more spontaneous feedback is actually the more valuable. I believe it is Um, because it's at that moment where you're addressing situations and and it creates teamwork. It creates a lot of different things. So humility is extremely important. The self-awareness is very important. But of course, you shouldn't be doing it in an echo chamber. Uh, The other thing as well is your role as a leader to a certain extent is to ensure that someone can take your job at some point in time right succession planning yep so if you are not spending the time to actually be the mentor and what does that mean i work with a with a lot of people in the financial institutions because of course my background is finance um and so there's risk aversion especially at the banks and therefore there's a culture of fear around making mistakes and so therefore there's sort of a lack of innovation and if you think about it the only way we learned how to walk is by falling down a number of times until we gained our balance so as a leader you have to also understand how you can create an environment that allows for growth from mistakes you know, one of the things I talk about in Possibility in Action is something that I talk about with my, my leadership teams all the time is back in World War One, no, World War Two. Now, now I can't even remember. A lot of planes were getting shot down. And so they started analyzing the planes when they would return from battle to see where the majority of the bullet holes were. And then they wanted to put armor around it. And then somebody just raised their hands and said, but we're making a complete mistake. These planes have returned. So we're looking at the wrong set of data. We have, we have to look at the ones that went down. And that's what looking at mistakes constructively is about. Yep. You know, it's not just 
penalizing someone or cutting their bonus. And, you know, that's individual on how companies want to deal with that because, of course, the shareholders and everything else. But it's the fact that what are the learnings and can you create an environment where you learn from that? So and this <laughs> what we're talking about now in terms of leadership development, we are our own leaders in our lives. Our life is the environment where we need to be a leader yeah. to live the life we want. And I always found it really interesting why, yes, it's true, there are certain skills maybe when you're you're dealing with a team and everything else, but you know, your children are your team. Your community is your team. So I, a lot of the things that I, I I bring into the corporate office are the same things that I use with with transformational clients as well. Yeah, you know, you said something there that that also struck a chord with me is, as leaders, we need to make sure that we're training somebody to take our job, and that is a philosophy that I've espoused really over the past probably five to six years or so is creating a team. And, and there's a quote that also comes to mind for me is create a team so strong you don't know who the leader is. And as the most senior leader, it is your duty to build that team, to empower that team and to take a, a back seat so that they can step up, they can get the exposure and the opportunity to learn and grow. And a lot of people kind of scratch their head whenever I tell them that I'm responsible for leading IT and HR and safety and transportation and business solutions and ESG, like all of this stuff, They're like how on earth? Can you possibly have time in your day to do that? And my response is, I don't. I have all of these incredible leaders that we've built up over the years. If I step away, every single one of them can completely run their department and their team. And one of them will, would rise into the role that I'm in today. And I think it's so unfortunate that some people build a life around <laughs> A number of different things, but probably level of income is, is one of them where they have this expensive house, all these fancy cars and boats and all of this stuff. And if they lose their job, they they're petrified. So they operate in this state of fear of losing their job. And in recent years, you know, I, I've come to realize if I lose my job, I'd be unfortunate. I would miss the team, but life will go on. I will find and, and go do something else. And I think that is part of what has driven me to want to empower them and want to build them up. So living that life of purpose and fulfilling and sometimes living below your means, which not everybody can do. So everybody likes to keep up with the Joneses, like I said earlier, and they just keep on making more money and getting a bigger house and a bigger boat and, and all of that stuff. But Man, when you create that environment where somebody can step into your shoes, the entire team succeeds. And what I found is all ships rise with the tide along with that. And that's so true. What I, the two things that I want to call out on that is, you know, the idea of, you know, building your team and sort of, you know, you don't know who the leader is. There are a lot of people that they attach their identity so much to being the person in the front, right? And this is where at the beginning, when I talked about like my idea or my definition of purpose, it's when you want to give the results away, right? So if you, nobody really knows who the leader is, you're an amazing leader. And Liz Weisman talks about this in terms of, you know, multiplier and diminishers and stuff like that. Um, there's also an exercise I, I do with some clients where I give them scenarios of an empty position that needs to be filled and a couple of candidates. And they usually choose the candidate that has the most experience in the field. Mm -hmm. But in the case itself, it talks about how the team is a really strong team, but they lack motivation. And one of the candidates is a great motivator, but doesn't really have experience in that, that area. Who's the right fit? Well, you can have the discussion, but if the team is really strong, bring in somebody that has the skill to help that team get motivated because that's what they're looking for. And that other 
person that comes in as the leader can learn if they're humble mm -hmm. from the team itself and everybody benefits. So again, if, if we just circle back to the idea of it's not about keeping up with the Joneses and it's, and for some people it is, but at the end of the day, the keeping up with the Joneses, the house and all of this other stuff, yes, they may be important. Ask yourself why those things are important. Why do those things take a priority over maybe having a team that nobody knows you're the leader? Yeah. And I think that's where a lot of the transformation comes from. Once you mm -hmm. sort of understand the whys behind a lot of things. I'm not a big archaeological dig person. Why is important. You have to understand why you're doing some things. I'm more a what's next type person. Even if you don't know the why necessarily. So what do you want to do with it? Yep. Okay. You realize you're not happy with this thing in your life. Yeah, we could figure out. Maybe we're going to go all the way back to your childhood. I don't know. We'll figure that. But what do you want to do? What's the steps you have to do to get to what you want? And you'll move away from it. Yeah. So. Yeah. Man, I love this. Oh, I think you and I could talk for, for hours on end. I'm I loving this conversation. I've got some other stuff that I do want to talk about. And you mentioned sure. Liz Wiseman. I love her book, Multipliers. For all of you watching or listening, I'll put the link to that book in the show notes. But a phenomenal book if you haven't had the opportunity to to read it. So Robert, let's talk a little bit about public speaking and kind of sure. how you have got into that. And then also, I know you have an event coming up here in November, if I remember correctly. Share a little bit with the listeners about public speaking. What are some of the things that you enjoy and are passionate about talking about? And then talk through this event. I was actually looking at your website this morning at this six or seven day event. So, so share share with us a little bit about that. Sure. Um, I'll start a little bit with the, with the public speaking because I'm a talker. So <laughs> that's one thing for sure. I'm a talker. Um, but I literally fell into public speaking. Um, and this comes from the journey with my wife. And after she passed away, her story was front page of the New York Times. And that doesn't really happen for most people. But it was written in a way that it was a little sensationalized, but that's how you get on the front page of the New York Times. So I started getting invited to all these palliative care conferences. And that's really what brought to light how much I like to communicate with people. Like, and what I really get out of it is the ahas I see when I talk to people. And knowing that, and again, it's this whole idea we're content creators, right? Like if I whether it's possibility in action in the book or whether it's whatever I do, if I have had an impact on someone where they say, that was the moment that changed my life, or you know what, I woke up at that, I've had some people use that exact word, and you know, I woke up from complacency at that moment. That's what it's all about for me. Um, when it comes to speaking on the business side and within organizations and stuff like that, it is because I was lucky enough to be around some amazing leaders. And I saw the difference for sure. Um, and they may not have been people that I worked directly with either. Um, but I know that we just have to get out of our own way. And so that's that's the public speaking and I, and I absolutely love it. The the November event um I love coaching. I absolutely love coaching. But what I've realized is that engagement in a topic having constructive conversations having a 
that spark in a situation is so impactful when you discover it yourself because then you own it you're not learning it right so i thought about possibility in action the book i thought about a lot of things i'm a matrix fan i'm a superhero fan i'm all kinds of different fans right so but the matrix talks about um you know the the real world and so forth and the matrix really is um it was plato's uh, analogy of the cave Basically, if you go back to, you know, people living in a cave and they didn't know what the real world was and then they went out into the sun and it was all crazy and stuff. Well, there's a place in Italy called Matera in Puglia, which is where Passion of the Christ was filmed. And it's literally cave homes. And I started thinking about that. And then I said, you know what? I want to host a retreat in Puglia going to different places we're, we're having fun, we're eating good food, we're drinking good wine, we're seeing really cool places, but we're discussing some of these things in those locations. There's a place in Puglia where they say the Holy Grail was actually housed for a while. Okay. So we go there and we have a little conversation about what is your Holy Grail? What is your, and are you, are you protecting it? Are you doing what needs to be done for something as important as a Holy Grail, right? And so, um, it's over Thanksgiving week because I'm a big believer in gratitude and I'm a big believer in gratitude is just not listing three things you're happy for. Uh, and I think it's a great practice. I, I really, I really do, but it's not the thing itself. It's the emotion it creates. That's why we suffer from loss because it's that emotion we had to that thing. So it's very important to sort of understand the emotions you're thankful for, for such an experience. So I thought it would be nice to have it over that week. Um, and so it's November 19th to the 26th, and we're gonna visit six different places. We're gonna make pasta. We're staying at an ancient villa in Puglia. We're going to go to an olive grove and pick olives and see how olive oil is made and, you know, understand if we're all harvesting what we want yeah. and if we're we're taking care of, you know, our orchard. <laughs> so it's more chatting, storytelling than necessarily coaching. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. And I would imagine an environment like that pulls people together from all sorts of different backgrounds, gives them the opportunity to network and learn from one another. I always enjoy going to events like that and seminars and summits and, and things just to get that exposure to other people and have the opportunity to, to learn from others. So I love that you're putting that event on. I'm going to look into it. I'm not sure I'll be able to make it, but I actually might try to sign up for something like that because it just yeah. sounds so incredibly powerful. Okay. Great. What is your favorite book? Wow, that is an amazing question. And that's really hard for me to answer one book because every single book has has resonated with me. Um, wow, I I don't want to say one because we we've already talked about it, and so that's yeah. that's where the quote comes from. Um, Touching the void is is also impossibility in action. I think it's an an incredible book. Okay, an absolute incredible book of the Mountaineers. Um, Fahrenheit four fifty one. Or is it four fifty two? Okay. I forget now. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's four fifty one. Um, I absolutely love it. Um, hmm. let me see what what else could I think of that really any of Richard Box books I, I I will I will say for sure um, anything recent that I've read that really resonated with me um, Craig Stanlin wrote a book called Blank Canvas um, he's a gentleman that actually tried to keep up with the Joneses to the point where he committed a federal crime 
oh. so he could make sure that he bought his wife all the things that she wanted. Wow. And um, yeah, had to restart his whole life and the whole keeping up with the Joneses thing. So, yeah. but I don't have, I really don't have one book that, Touching the Void, I, I do read every year. Okay. Uh, so that's one of the books I go back. But I tend to be that way anyway. Um, I'll, I'll read a lot of books uh, over and over again. Fahrenheit 450, yeah, I'm going to say 451 because that's what wants to come out. Uh, I read that periodically as well. Okay. I just read, and I read it like 10 years ago, and I just reread it. Um, wow. I'm, it's, the, it's the kid that went to Alaska, and he wound up, you know, camping and uh, he wasn't prepared or whatever. I'm trying to, his, his name was Chris McCandles and I can't remember the name into the wild. My God, I can't believe I just forgot that. Uh, also interesting. Cause it's a, it's a lot like Thoreau, which Walden Walden Pond as well is something that I, I like to read. Um, Marcus Aurelius meditations. I'll read often. I'm a big stoic fan. Yeah. Um, you know, Ryan Holiday's books are cool. So, okay, all right. Not not Ryan. one book though. No, that fair enough. That that's quite all right. I think for me, I I am very similar in that regard. Uh, Multipliers always comes up for me just because that's such an incredible read. I'm a big fan of Jocko Willink and Extreme Ownership and Dichotomy oh, sure. of Leadership, those types of books. Actually, I really like those on audiobook because it's narrated by Jocko and Leif, and, and they kind of talk through some of their experiences in Ramadi, and then they kind of correlate that to, to corporate America and delegation and communication and, and things like that. So those stand out for me. For all of you listening, we'll go ahead and put all of these books in the show notes. So there's going to be a long list of them, but I think <laughs> that's, that's always good to have some some variety in, in the types of books that you're reading. Robert, what is the one thing that you would like our listeners to take away from this conversation? I'll tell you right away. The one thing I would love for everyone to to take away from this is that we are all the craftspeople of our life. It's not in anyone's hands at all. And what I mean by that is, yes, stuff happens. Stuff definitely happens. It's how we react to it. Um, you know, a man's search for meeting. There you go. Another <laughs> another book, Viktor Frankl. Um, but we have the power of how we react. It's just a, it's a choice make it a conscious choice. So if anything, I'd like people to be more conscious yeah. in what they're doing. Mm -hmm. I love it. Okay. How do the listeners and viewers contact you? The best place is just to go to my website, which is just my name, robertparty.com. Um, it's a little cumbersome <laughs> because there's a lot of moving pieces that are, that are taking place. Um, because I'm adding some new products come September. So, uh, but that's the best place. Okay, perfect. All and right. LinkedIn, Rob by the way, LinkedIn, LinkedIn. I'm not a big Facebook, Instagram person, but LinkedIn for sure. Okay, perfect. That sounds fantastic. Robert, thank you so much for your time. This has been an incredible conversation. Actually, I hope to have you again on the show at some point in the future because I think you've got so much value and uh, looking forward to our conversations in the future. For all of you listening and watching, thank you so much for your time and y'all have a good one.